Welcome to another session of Lectures by Lubizzi. I'm your host, Dr. Lubizzi. Today marks the second video of uh, an installment dealing with economics. So today's video is about socialism. Uh, before we get started, just a very brief definition of what it is. Uh, socialism, a key characteristic is governmental ownership of uh, property and government making uh, key economic uh, decisions as far as uh, what to produce, how much, the cost, and then also wages or salaries of the uh, citizens. This is in marked um, distinction from capitalism, which is characterized by private ownership of property. Uh, one of the key benefits of socialism is uh, economic equality. Okay, so one of the key criticisms or critiques of capitalism is that it, it tends to create uh, economic inequality, uh, although it does uh, offer capitalism, that is, offers uh, economic freedom, uh, inequality is uh, tends to be a uh, hallmark of capitalism, at least uh, among some. So um, advocates of uh, socialism um, state that, you know, the benefit is economic equality. All right. So in our uh, lesson today, I want to talk about um, the history of socialism. And before we get to it, we have to kind of discuss what took place first uh, or prior. Um, so during the uh, Industrial Revolution, uh, starting in England in the mid 1700s, we see rapid industrialization along with rapid uh, urbanization. And this creates a lot of uh, wealth uh, and employment opportunities, but there's a lot of uh, human suffering due to unsafe working conditions, low wages, uh, and then overcrowding in the cities and a lot of disease and things like that. So um, the living conditions were, were very bad. And so this led uh, some people to... Uh, push for more governmental involvement, um, not necessarily in the economy, but to improve conditions uh, in cities uh, for the lives of the citizenry. Uh, this is kind of blocking my face. Let me move that away. At any rate, um, so utilitarianism uh, got its start by a man by the name of Jeremy uh, Bentham, so it's a uh, philosophy and so his uh concern was with ethics and um ethical behavior okay so that's that's sort of with with regard to philosophy that tends to be a um an important um uh, discovery or you know interest um like vice and virtue and things like that so that goes all the way back to the ancient greeks ancient greek philosophers they talked a lot about vices and virtues, uh, especially Aristotle. Um, <clears throat> but so with with uh, Jeremy Bentham, he he discussed um, like moral morals um, and moral actions, uh, and they were predicated upon the idea that if an action, the effects of an action, produce more human happiness. Uh, that action was considered virtuous or moral. Um, and, and to the contrary, uh, actions that resulted in unhappiness or even human suffering or pain, um, it would be considered immoral, all right, and wrong. Uh, and so this differs to some degree with, you know, the Christian uh, or the Judeo-Christian concept of um, right and wrong. But anyway, this was used um, sort of as uh, as utilitarianism became more popular. It uh, was seen as sort of like the um, the, the moral um, precondition under which government should begin to take an act uh, take action uh, to alleviate some of the suffering that was uh, taking place in society. All right, so. Uh, one of his uh, proponents was a man by the name of um, uh, John Stuart Mill. <clears throat> so they argued um, that government should try to promote um, reforms. Okay. And so if you look, and this is just to kind of reiterate what I mentioned, 
um, with utilitarianism. So you can, again, um, determine whether an action is moral or immoral based on its outcome. So if it improves um, human happiness and reduces human suffering, then it's good. So th this sort of is in keeping um, with the spirit of the Enlightenment, which was about, you know, human progress. So it, it became more imperative uh, and necessary, people believe, for the government to take action because things were sort of dire in many of the industrial cities like Manchester and Birmingham uh, and in England, okay? So even though there was uh, growing uh, public pressure uh, for the government to play a larger role in improving the lives of its citizens, um, there was uh, a limitation. Um, th this idea with utilitarianism is that um, a person's uh, liberty uh, should not be interfered with uh, by the government. So, you know, there was um, kind of respect paid to that. And, that. and, you know, as far as a person's liberty is concerned, and this is where John Stuart Mill uh, talks about um, this concept. He says that the only purpose for which power can rightfully be exercised over any member of the of a civilized community <clears throat> against his will is to prevent harm to others. So um, there was tremendous respect given uh, to a person's uh, individual liberty, okay? Um, but be that as it may, um, there was a belief that there was a role for government. And more than that, and especially this is with John Stuart Mill, although it took a long time for sort of the rest of society to kind of um, come along with his belief system, uh, he argued for universal suffrage, um, not only for men, but also for women. So that was, at the time, um, considered to be pretty radical. Uh, his thinking and others like that uh, believed, that, you know, the rationale was um, if, if democracy was uh, increased, the number of people who uh, got to vote um, society would naturally become more moral, okay, and more utilitarian, okay, and so um, some of the first things that we see as far as utilitarianism, uh, utilitarianism is concerned is the development of professional uh, police departments, and that's what you see in the photo there is some early uh, English uh, police officers, only they weren't called that, they were called bobbies, um, that's named after the Prime Minister Robert Peel. Uh, they got that nickname, uh, Bobby's, because that was something that he uh, approved of. Okay, and so the idea of police, how what you might be asking, like from a utilitarian standpoint, what's the point? Well, they're there to keep order, prevent uh, crime. Um, so the, the idea is that the police officers would walk the beat and they would be visible and that would help prevent crime. And so that helped um, the lives of uh, the poor, uh, the working class, the working poor in many of these cities, you know, and of, of course that, um, you know, that, that gave people a sense of ease, okay? Um, and there was special attention uh, paid not to arm the police because they didn't want them to be kind of mistaken for, for soldiers, um, and so to kind of calm the people, uh, the bodies weren't armed. Um, but the next and probably most important um, step that uh, was taken kind of um, because of utilitarianism was um, sanitation, okay? And so there's a man by the name of Edwin Chadwick who was hired by Parliament to uh, conduct a study, and he uh, wrote a report on uh, the sanitary condition of the laboring poor. So there was there was a concern um, with poverty. And so that was really the purpose of his study was to study the urban poor and, um, you know, w what could be done uh, to alleviate that? What could be done to lower the numbers of the poor? And uh, his findings were that people were dying um, in the poor neighborhoods and really throughout many of these uh, urban cities due to poor sanitation, um, lack of clean drinking water, uh, specifically lack of uh, sewers and regular garbage collection. Um, <clears throat> he said that uh, 
death and disease causes poverty. And so if you want to reduce the number of um, impoverished uh, people or citizens in these cities, then th there has to be more attention paid to sanitation. And so because of him, in large part because of Edwin Chadwick, uh, England becomes the first country to uh, pass a public health act. And so that was the Public Health Act of uh, 1848. And so what it does is it proposes ways to um, provide clean uh, drinking water and then uh, also like just to get rid of the filth. Um, this it, it's important to note, I guess, that um, this is before the germ theory of disease. So in the 1870s, because of the work of Louis Pasteur and, and really others, too, um, there was a connection between uh bacteria uh, and disease and and at this time they, they there is no connection although he realized that if you get rid of the filth then it's likely that uh, disease you know the outbreak of disease will uh, will be reduced another man that's uh, important with regard to this utilitarianism it was it was John Snow and so there were a number of cholera outbreaks uh, in England, and I think this cartoon kind of depicts, um, you see, I don't know, the skeleton is pumping water uh, for the citizens to drink, but it's it's not clean. Uh, it's tainted um, with some type of contagion. And so uh, because of uh, the work of Jon Snow, we get the first um, uh, water filtration systems um, that help clean uh, the water, you know, and eliminate the contagion. So not only uh, do they use filtration systems, um, they, they did a lot of uh, filtration with sand, but then also treating the filtered water uh, with some chlorine uh, to uh, to kill some of the bacteria. Uh, and, and it worked. And so a lot of other countries uh, followed suit. And um, yeah, so that's a big step uh, with regard to um, utilitarianism. Okay, so how, where do we go next? We go we go next to socialism. Uh, as I said, there was there was criticism of capitalism, and there was a uh, a belief that government could do more. Okay, so the next step is for the government to step into the uh, into the economy. Um, to sort of level the playing field, okay? So socialism, uh, as mentioned earlier, is uh, defined as state rather than private ownership of the means of production, and uh, key decisions um, are made by the government, okay? Uh, and this, you know, flies in the face of what Adam Smith talked about with the metaphor, the invisible hand, that the invisible hand, um, because of people's self-interest, uh, seems to do a perfect job of making those decisions um, as far as what's produced, how much to produce, and at what price. Um, but with socialism, we see uh, that being replaced with the government, the government making those decisions. And again, this is uh, to create a more equitable uh, outcome for the citizens, okay? However, that is not how uh, socialism began. Uh, there was uh, a group of uh, early, um, we'll just call them thinkers, um, that uh, in Europe, both in France and in Great Britain, uh, that would be classified today as uh, they're called utopian socialists. And they believed that if pressure, um, public pressure could be applied to business owners, um, large factory owners, if pressure could be applied to them to um, share uh, the fruits of their labor with um, the, uh, well, the fruits of their, their workers' labor with them, that a more equitable society could be created, all right? And that the goal for the utopian socialists was uh, for the means of production and everything like that to be uh, shared, okay? So, you know, a word that helps describe uh, capitalism as competition. Uh, th these early utopian socialists used the word uh, cooperation. Okay, so they were, they thought that uh, competition created greed and immorality. And um, 
that that cooperation would kind of root out some of that all right um and so again um they believed in in the workers sort of sharing everything okay Karl Marx used the term uh, utopian uh, socialist because he thought that it was naive for them to think that uh, anything like that situation could be achieved uh, short of violent revolution, okay? The utopian socialists believed that, kind of like the utilitarians, that if uh, there was universal suffrage, if everyone had the right to vote, that eventually the workers would begin electing people in government that would start taking over uh, the means of production and ensuring um, that that the outcomes were more um, equal and equitable. Okay, so that term utopian socialist was was coined by Karl Marx, who we'll talk about in a later video, but it, was, it wasn't exactly uh, a nice way to describe them. Um, so for this time period, that is sort of the extent of what socialism is. It's more just like a theoretical framework. It's just an idea. It's not until uh, later uh, that, that socialism really uh, appears. And so Governments uh, in some countries, uh, first starting with um, Russia, uh, they have the Bolshevik uh, Revolution uh, at the end of World War One, and so they they are the first country uh, to become socialistic. Um, so a lot of people, and in the last video I mentioned this, a lot of people become confused with um, the differences uh, between socialism and communism. The Soviet Union, um, China, North Korea, Vietnam, uh, Cuba have communist governments uh, and they have a communist political party that sort of dominates. However, that's not what they are economically. Um, socialism is governmental control. A lot of people also mistake um, countries like uh, Sweden and uh, Norway, especially uh, Scandinavian countries, uh, and refer to them as, well, aren't they socialist countries? And the answer is no, they're not. They, they, they're like the United States. They're, they're mixed. They're mixed economies. Uh, they just tend to be more socialistic uh, than the United States. Um, so the 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 last thing that I want to talk about are some of the you know criticisms of uh, socialism and uh, shortcomings. All right, and so uh, one of the problems with socialism, as it's been practiced in those countries that I mentioned, like the Soviet Union, China, uh, Vietnam, uh, North Korea. Uh, Cuba and the latest uh, Venezuela is the lack of incentives um, because of uh, high high taxation people aren't rewarded uh, for hard work and so as a result these societies are less productive um, and people don't like the fact that most of their income or a large percentage of it is is taken uh, due to taxation all right so what this inevitably causes is as i said lower productivity and if a country is less productive then they're going to have less wealth and that's going to lead to um, a lower standard of living okay um, another disadvantage of socialism is inefficiency OK, um, and, and that's mainly due to the fact that there's no innovation. There are no improvements made um, because it's run by the government. Unless the government makes the decision that uh, a new innovation is necessary, they won't happen. A um, couple of people, you know, people make jokes about uh, the Department of Motor Vehicles or the License Bureau, that it's it's a governmental um, governmental run 
you know, entity. And so when you go there, uh, typically you're met with uh, very long lines um, and it seems to not be very efficient. Um, uh, the same is true of the post office. When you go to the post office, uh, unfortunately, long lines and, you know, lack of uh, efficiencies. Uh, you can contrast that with, you know, if you go to uh, Chick-fil-A, uh, it's in their best interest to get people um, through the line quickly. And so they come up with efficiencies and improvements so they can get more customers through the door quickly. And so the, 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 the line is uh, less long. Okay. So that's kind of um, dealing with inefficiencies. And the, the next is uh, a lot of governmental red tape. Um, it takes a long time for the government to make decisions regarding things. And again, it just doesn't run very effectively. And then uh, the last is, and especially with many of the countries uh, that I mentioned, Soviet Union, China, Cuba, North Korea, they're known for having uh, autocratic rulers um, that, so the more powerful that these uh, rulers become, uh, the more chances there are for there to be corruption. And uh, when there's governmental corruption, uh, oftentimes the citizenry are the victims. Uh, and so, you know, although the intentions for socialism are very, uh, you know, honorable, uh, to help limit in, uh, inequality, uh, the, the results are have been uh, up to this point where socialism has been practiced. It's been pretty disastrous. Uh, so that's really it for uh, this video. Uh, appreciate your time. Uh, the final video will be brief, uh, but it will be a discussion of uh, communism uh, for this series. Thank you.